Hello everybody and welcome back to another episode of Two Weird Didn't Watch, the show where we make fun of movies that we have not seen, based on nothing but their weird descriptions. I'm Brantley. And I'm Albert! Uh, Brantley, you said when we started this call that uh, you had an episode that was a very special episode, and you warned me it might run long. Yes. The, these are very exciting, both of those are very exciting pieces of news for me. So, uh, Brantley, what are we going to be talking about today? We're going to be talking about the Memiverse. Mem, as in, like, like meme, but without the E at the end? As in Christopher R. Mim, which is spelled M-I-H-M. Okay. Is Christopher R. Mim a real person? Who he is. has created a universe? Or he, okay, I was, my other guess was that he is a fictional character around which a universe has been based. Every movie he's made is in this universe, and he's made a movie a year since 2006. I'm so old, Brentley, that <laughs> I heard 2006, and I was like, well, that wasn't that long ago. <laughs> Sorry <laughs> for being so old. Yep, that was uh, 14 years, though, bud. He okay. hasn't made one this year yet, so I'm wondering what that's going to be. I'm sure he will be busy shooting something around his house, right? Like... <laughs> These are not high budget movies, no. Yeah. They're all done in the style like they were made in the fifties. They're all all except for the one made last year are in black and white, and they're all using roughly the special effects you would have around them. Around then. Okay. Okay. But so just keep that in mind when it's we go forward. Definitely still being shot on like a DSLR or some digital device, right? Yeah, probably. Okay. Oh, yeah, you don't know, because you haven't seen it. I was going to say, if if one of these pastiche products had the balls to use film, I would have so much more respect for them. I have very little respect for these pastiche products. Including, I was thinking about this, I have, I'm thinking about doing a video essay about the difference between the Asylum and the types of crappy movies they make, and the velocipaster kind of crappy movie where in my opinion the asylum is not making movies ironically they're making them uh what's the word for when you're just doing it for the money like they it, they they're practical right it's just yeah. mer- they're mercenaries but they're not making uh, they're not making movies that are supposed to be like, oh, we love these really bad movies and we're going to make bad movies just like them. They're just making big budget blockbuster movies with no money. And Sharknado aside, I think that, that there's a different attitude about movies like Velocipaster, which I tried to watch, Brantley. It was out on Prime or something and I finally did get around to watching it and they had one of these jokey edits where they put in like insert shot of burning car here Mm. you would never get that in asylum movie you would get terrible terrible like after effects flames or a yeah it's kind of like cast over a car that's not even damaged yeah it wouldn't look good but they would have given you the thing they would have given you something to look at because (laughs) it's not a joke it's just a bad movie. Right. The, the best bad movies need to be trying to make a good movie with no money, not trying to make a bad movie because you you enjoyed sitting around with your friends and watching bad movies. I get that. But, you know, aim for something. That might come up here in Mr. Mim's uh oeuvre. Uh Okay. As far as like I, I'm just getting that out there as sort of that's my attitude towards the uh homage but we don't have any money but we're pretending like we're making it bad on purpose kind of movies okay you're digging yes stop me from talking Brantley (laughs) the first movie in this series is from 2006 it's the monster of phantom lake okay I feel like this one has actually popped up on my Amazon recommended list and I have not watched it but i I think that I could have at some point. The film takes place sometime in the 1950s near Phantom Lake in Mukwangunago, Wisconsin. The movie's opening scene reveals the lake has been 
has long been the site of illegal toxic waste dumping. All right, all right. As opposed to the very legal version of toxic waste dumping, right? Like some of those... <laughs> I don't think like the guys go, we have some toxic waste, can we dump it in the river? Well, you have to go down to that side of the room over there <laughs> and talk to the toxic waste dumping in the river person and get the toxic waste, toxic waste dumping in the river permit before you can do it. Okay, here we go. <laughs> These guys didn't have time for that. One weekend, Michael Lobo Kaiser, which is a great name, a former soldier and local kook, falls into the deadly waters. What? <laughs> the fact, I all of that together, right? His name is yeah. Lobo. His nickname is Lobo. I wonder if that's self-imposed. Like, hi, my name is Michael, but my friends call me uh, Lobo. He was a former soldier. It's probably just a nickname from them. Or, or well, just because he was in the military doesn't mean he wasn't still a huge dork. He was a military photographer. <laughs> yes, he was. He worked in the kitchen. There you go. Um, <laughs> I don't know, but his like, and then you add on top of that, he's a kook. Yeah, yeah. he just believes some really stupid stuff. He's listening a lot to Infowars, and uh, you know, doesn't believe in the World Health Organization's uh recommendations about masks. When they said you shouldn't wear them, he was saying that you should. And now that they've switched, he's like, whoa, now I don't... I, everybody, keep the masks off. Cough right on me, guys. Because that's how much of a conspiracy nut he is. He's going against the green. Ah. Anyways, uh, this local hook, he falls into the deadly waters and is transformed into a muck monster with a deadly touch. This huh. coincides with two different groups camping by the lake on that same weekend. Do you think oh, it yes. matters? Like, are we talking about a muck monster that retains its uh, consciousness? So he has all of his. Let's pretend he is actually good at being military, right? Let's let's put aside the kitchen thing. Does he retain all of his military training, or does it really not even matter who fell in the lake? And they would have all turned into hideous, super strong muck monsters. Since this is based in like a fifties movies, it probably doesn't matter. It seems like a waste to have all that set up and then be like, eh, yeah, he's he's dumb wah, wah, now. It's probably the main character's trying to figure out who he is. It probably doesn't. It probably doesn't open with him announcing to just the wilderness that he was in the army. <laughs> I used to be in the army and now I'm a kook. My name's Michael, <laughs> but you can call me Lobo. He's talking to a tree. Yeah. All right, so I want you to guess what the two groups camping by the lake are. Uh, okay, so one of them is a, uh, like, Christian teen outing, there and the other one is, um, bikers who are trying to kick their meth habits by getting in touch with nature. We're basing this in the 50s, man. Oh. Uh, bikers who are trying to kick their marijuana habits by getting in touch with na nature. Okay, you got the teenagers, right? It's a teenager celebrating oh, the recent oh. graduation from high school. Okay. The other is local college science instructor Professor Jackson and his research assistant Stephanie Yates. Because we have to have that pretty female who's just kind of there to be kind of obese. What are For they examining researching? Animals. Oh, oh, you're what? about to tell me. I'm sorry. I was going to ask what they're researching. Uh, the local animals and discovering some truly frightening mutations. Besides and then also the a muck monster. monster. Yeah. <laughs> that too. On the side. Yes. So... He, you've got the professor. He's probably older and like, well, I don't know. I don't know how much access this guy has to older people. If he's making sort of independent movies, older people might not have time for that nonsense. Um, right, right. <laughs> so maybe this guy's like 30 and then his research assistant is also 30, but played much younger <laughs> um, because that's how these types of things work. Mm -hmm. And then what's the other group? Teenagers celebrating graduation. Hmm. Okay. I don't have much on them except they're they're gonna be like oh, remember, more... remember they're fifties teens. I I don't think this guy knows anything about what the actual fifties were like. I'd be willing to bet he watched the blob once and he thought like, yeah, I can do that. No, th I've th I'm probably being too mean. I don't want to be disrespectful to Mr. Mim, but um I don't I don't have the most confidence in the sort of accuracy to the era. All right. I am assuming they're just going to be your standard stereotypes. You got the jock, you got the slut, you got the nerd, you got the the good the sort of neutral dude who ends up the last up. girl. Yeah, there's probably a last girl. Uh well that might be the research assistant. 
That's fair. So they're all going to kind of meet up together and, you know, do probably not. It's not going to matter what their stereotype is. They're just going to be dumb and the muck monster kills them off. Fair enough. Is that the end of the first one? That's the end of the first one. Okay. Now we're going Um, into another movie. And Mm -hmm. we know it takes place in the same universe. Yes, this is the only one that is a direct follow-up to the previous movie. Oh, okay. I was going to ask, is the muck man going to return? Does he die at the end of the first movie? Because we didn't get that detail in the description. Well, I guess we're about to find out. This one is a kid from another world! Exclamation point. It's a, a, exclamation point's better than a question mark. <laughs> it came from another world? Woo, oh, no, we, watched, we couldn't figure out where it came from. Professor Jackson is once again our main character as he is sent to track down his missing colleague and best friend, Dr. Frazier, who has yet to report in after an extended research trip in the area around Phantom Lake. Okay. By the way, Phantom Lake, really cool name for a lake. Yeah, I'm assuming also that this person is actually from Wisconsin, Mr. Mim. I believe so. I didn't look too much into his personal life. Oh, I'm not trying to call him out or anything. (laughs) If you're setting your movie in Wisconsin, there's not a ton of reasons to do that, and one of them is that's where you live. Fair enough. Or maybe it's because nobody lives there, so they can't be like, there's no Phantom Lake. It's like, yeah, you don't live there. There's eight billion lakes in Wisconsin. That's a true fact. You can look it up. (laughs) I bet there is actually a Phantom Lake. I'm going to look it up now. I bet there's more than one. Yeah, there it is. It's in Bellevue, Wisconsin, or Washington? What's Wa? Beautiful, wherever it is. (laughs) With the assistance of canoe cops Sven and Gustav. Okay. Do you have an interjection, sir? I, I, I love the idea of canoe cops. Yep. <laughs> they're like bicycle cops, but on canoes. Yes. They're, in my mind, they're dressed exactly like the bicycle cops, no, right? with, like the helmet and everything, and they, and yep. but they have life vests also. Yep. And the shades. Professor Jackson goes in search of Doctor Frazier, who claims to have lost track of time after discovering a mysterious meteor deep in the forest. Okay. 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 It is later revealed that the meteor contained an alien intelligence called the King of the Universe who takes possession of Dr. Fraser's body and begins seeking an appropriate host for his queen. Man, this King of the Universe guy, his parents really, uh, really dinged him with that name, huh? Yep. Must have got picked on a lot in high high school. (laughs) Hey, Mr. King of the Universe! Shut up! Your dad's a garbage man. You're king of nothing. (laughs) Shut up, guys. Okay, so his uh, he's going to get his friend, he's lost time, and he's been possessed, essentially, by a demon? Uh, What's a space demon? Alien intelligence. Yeah, space demon, basically. Space ghost. ghost right, ghost. it doesn't super matter if it's, like, yeah. alien or... De- it's the same principle. A- outside world thing comes and takes over your body. I actually really like this uh, as a premise. Mm-hmm. It reminds me of a lot of science fiction stuff I've read. The very first thing that came to my mind when you were saying the sort of the basis of the lost time and uh, uh, the possession was there's a Philip K. Dick story called The Father Thing, which is about a kid who's trying to deal with the fact that he knows that his dad has been, like, taken over by some alien hive intelligence, but nobody else knows about it. Uh, And, uh, you know, it's obvious, like, nobody's going to believe a kid that that's happened. So, um, really interesting type of a juxtaposition. A lot of things you could do with that. I don't know if this movie is going to be doing anything interesting with him, but it's a cool idea. Well, naturally, he chooses Professor Jackson's girlfriend, Julie Ann St. Marie. Okay. Naturally. Once again, Professor Jackson and the Canoe Cuts must save the world. I know this man is dealing with the limitations of shooting a movie with the people who are willing to probably work for almost nothing and maybe some pizza afterwards. You think um, this guy's just showed up with canoes? Uh, no, I think that it probably well, is just that. like, he has access to a lake. He lives in Wisconsin, so he has access to 8 billion lakes. So canoes are just everywhere, and you got to use what you have, Brantley. If you're a filmmaker of the caliber and the budget of Mr. Mim, you can't, like, 
ex- expect to be able to have skyscrapers blowing up unless it's like way off in the background and you could do it with Photoshop. So if you got access to a lake and a canoe, A, because there are 8 billion lakes in Wisconsin, there probably are actual canoe cops. That's fair. Um, so maybe this is just the thing that we don't know about. I'm looking that up now, too. Um, oh. Well, I found a book called Canoe Cops vs. the Mummy on Amazon, which you well, can read amazing. on Kindle for $3 by Stephen Sullivan. And! And! And? Christopher Mim! Who wrote the foreword? Christopher Mim is like, yeah, I'll, I'll sign off on Canoe Cops wherever they appear in fiction. As long as you... His greatest contribution to the world. You have to get permission to, from me to use Canoe Cops. Oh, I love this. We've stumbled it. There's there's a literary angle to the Mimiverse. <laughs> Maybe we'll have to cover that one in a little bit. Um, right. but go ahead. This, by the way, Canoe Cops versus the Mummy also takes place at Phantom Lake. But you go on with yours. Okay. Next up, we have Cave Women on Mars from 2008. Set in the far off future of 1987. I the like movie that. sits. That's yeah, great. no, that's actually really, really fun. Because <laughs> remember, these are these quote came out in the 50s. Yes, yes, yes. The movie sees two astronauts, Captain Mike or Michael Mike Jackson and Lieutenant William Liam Elliott. Very important that we know these names. Making mankind's first trip to Mars. Upon landing. Lieutenant Elliot finds himself embroiled in a power struggle between two tribes. The dark-haired, black-leather-clad Liak and the blonde-haired Zill. Okay. How do you think... Oh, we're going to continue our assumption that this is being shot in Wisconsin. What do you think he's shooting for Mars? It doesn't seem like... I, I don't, I've never been to Wisconsin. I actually have been to Wisconsin. That's probably a lie. Uh, my aunt lives there, but I don't remember a lot of it. But what I do remember was it's not, like, desert... There's some open fields that are kind of rocky looking, but... I mean, these are in black and white, so you could just say they're red. As right. As I've, I'm th- rocky I fields, can't yeah. remember a time when there weren't, uh, like, trees in the in Vision, though. Yeah. Uh, by the oh, way, yeah. Stephen D. Sullivan also wrote the novelization of Manos, The Hands of Fate. <laughs> <laughs> and a sequel, Ma- Manos Talons of Fate. Oh. So they're on Mars, and there's these blonde and dark-haired people. Are they, are we talking like an Amazon situation where they're all women, or is it both genders, blonde and... Uh, yeah. doesn't say, but the dark-haired ones are wearing black leather. <laughs> right. So, like, space bikers on Mars? It does say cave women, so I'm assuming, you know, cave women. <laughs> Okay. For the, uh, the blondes, at least. After trying and failing to rescue an escaped Liak slave, which was chased onto, onto Zill lands, Lieutenant Elliot is captured by an Amazon brigade led by Ina, warrior prime of the Zill tribe. So the Zills have an es- No, the Enak have an escaped slave. Mm-hmm. Captain Dude is trying to help her out. She's crossed over into the Zills, and then the Zills capture our Captain Hero guy. Yes. Okay. Now, he had a partner, Captain Michael. I, he just seems to have vanished from the narrative. <laughs> well, maybe he died. Or maybe he's like, I'm with these uh, Enoch people. They're hot. I don't I don't want to get involved with this war. I'll just flip a coin and pick a side. <laughs> he's just like, hey, non-interference. <laughs> he's just sitting in the ship. Listen, slavery's bad and everything, but have you heard of the Prime Directive? <laughs> we saw it in the 60s on Star Trek. You know about this in the far off future of 1987. <laughs> Lieutenant Elliot soon finds himself falling for Ina and vice versa, even before he is taken to the high priestess of the Zill tribe and informed of a prophecy which mentions him by name. You know, that's, uh, that's a pretty good prophecy. Mm-hmm. If you got a prophecy that's like names a dude, I'm trying to think. All of my pro- prophetic stuff is mostly from the Bible, so I'm trying to think if there's any that prophesy a name. Other the than, beast. like, this person who is still alive. Well, the Beast is a title, right? It's like an, 
It's an idea. I don't think... I'm guessing that if that prophecy were to be fulfilled, it wouldn't be like some dude who goes around calling himself the Beast. Hello, my name is Michael James the Beast. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm the Beast Smith. <laughs> Talk about having trouble in grade school. <laughs> First name the middle name Beast. <laughs> yes. He's good friends with The Rock. Yeah. What's our next one? Terror from Beneath the Earth from 2009. Okay. Local children Danny and Alice Johnson disappear in the local Wasawa cave system shortly after the caves are determined to be hopelessly irradiated thanks to underground nuclear bomb testing. In Wisconsin? Yes. Yeah. I don't think so. Nobody lives there. I mean, fair enough. <laughs> but it's also so, I think even the military would be like, you know what, we're gonna, we're gonna, we like this Nevada thing. It's cold, it's not so cold, and the humidity's okay. We'll just blow things up in the good weather. You guys, you're, you're fine with your, like, 30 below zero. You can have it. Thankfully, Alice's school books are discovered by visiting British scientist Dr. Vincent Edwards and his assistant slash niece, Rosemary Bennett, while they are spelunking. I like the niece angle. I feel like the nieces aren't in a, as many modern, like, movies. No, nobody actually cares about their uncle or their aunt or whatever anymore. In, uh, well, uncles only fiction. exist to be rich and die, and you've never heard of them, and they leave you a house that's probably haunted. That's all they exist for. Right. Whereas the niece connection gives you, like, a relative, so there's no possibility of a, like, romantic thing, but it's not like father daughter so it's not that close you have you can keep the sort of friendship e uh dynamic but also like write off any possibility of there being any uh romantic stuff right the two report their findings to sheriff elliot as he is taking a statement from stan johnson regarding his missing kids so what is it that they figure out again uh they find alice's school books while they're spelunking Oh, the school books. I, I, I'm yeah. sorry, that didn't read for me when you said it. Um, so they're like, they're just sort of hanging out. Are these caves known to be irradiated? Because everybody seems to be just walking around in these caves, which the description has told us are definitely, definitely deadly irradiated. They are determined to be. It doesn't mean, doesn't say that they're like labeled. We are determined to be irradiated, darn it. If we, what, no matter what we have to do, we have decided irradiation is the way for us. So they just bust in on this, like, report where the dad's like, oh, we, where's my daughter? And they're like, hey, we got her books! How about this? In the cave. Uh, the, the, the dad's probably making a scene because he's, you know, his statement's being taken. And then, um, like, they just mentioned that, hey, we found these books in the cave. Yeah, it's yeah. It's like, that's my daughter's. It's a typical movie coincidence. Yeah. About the thing you shouldn't overhear. Yes, which people complain about, but like that's what stories are about. If you just like, otherwise a bunch it's really of boring. random things are not a story. <laughs> they should all be connected to the central narrative. <laughs> Man, I eavesdropping. He just talked about movies with his friend for like three hours. <laughs> I got bored and left. <sighs> I went in that class and they did not once mention time travel in this time travel <laughs> movie. That guy was teaching geography. He did it for 45 minutes. Who has 45 minutes for geography? <laughs> Anyways, the four go off to explore the caves together, but Rosemary is quickly overwhelmed by a bat swarm and abducted by a giant bat creature with a paralyzing touch. Okay. The muck monster at the beginning had a deadly touch. This guy likes yes. these sort of, like, you touch people and they die. Probably because it doesn't no require required. you to do any... <laughs> <laughs> prosthetics or choreography or anything. The death touch is just like, oh, they're out. Or yep. in this case, a unconscious Paralyzed. touch, but still yeah. same thing. And that way you can have the, the classic creature left goo and monster carries the unconscious woman shot. Absolutely. Stan runs off to rescue his children and Rosemary as Dr. Edwards and Sheriff Elliot return to the sheriff's office so Dr. Edwards can call a colleague and get the sonic device he thinks might stop the creature. Sonic devices. It's a bat. They were... Okay, yeah, that makes sense. I was thinking... My brain flipped over to Godzilla with that, and I was like, man, that was a terrible plot point in Godzilla. But, 
for uh, a bat creature? Yeah, I'll actually, I'll, I'll, I'll allow it. Up, like, up next, we have Destination, colon, Outer Space, from 2010. Okay, he's going, he's getting back into, like, how do you show this in Wisconsin territory? Although this probably could have some interiors if we're talking about, like, I'm just going to guess, based on Destination Outer Space, there's going to be, like, spaceships and space stations, and uh, maybe that'll be easier to do with, like, some real basic sets. Right, right. Set in 1992, five years after the events of Cave Women on Mars, former Captain Mike Jackson is spending his days drinking and feeling sorry for himself, having been court-martialed after the events of the earlier film. <laughs> You know how we always say, like, yeah, and then, like, as soon as the movie is over, he gets immediately sent to jail for life. Yep. (laughs) We have the prime directive, Michael. What are you doing? (laughs) You had sex with an alien woman, and your offspring is literally Satan. What are you doing? (laughs) Ah. Okay. Okay. I love this. Luckily, his father, who originally led the railroading against him, had a change of heart and pulled some strings to get Mike reinstated. His dad got him thrown in jail? And then was like, nah, reinstate him. He learned his lesson. I guess. Yeah, I wonder if this guy's working through some issues. Unluckily, it was as the test pilot for the ESS Venture, an experimental new spaceship with a faster-than-light speed star drive they aren't sure will work safely. Well... I I think this guy hates his kid. I mean... Would you rather be sitting in a cell for the rest of your life or doing something that might kill you, but at least gives you some freedom? I think I would go with the, I could maybe die, but at least I'm doing a thing. Fair enough. The good news is the ESS Venture doesn't blow up when the drive is activated. Oh, that is good news. The bad news is that Captain Jackson overshoots the projected target of Jupiter and is stranded in an uncharted section of outer space outside of clear radio contact with Earth. Okay, okay. I'm interested in the aesthetic of this. I know that, obviously, we haven't seen it, but I'm trying to imagine... I'm I'm picturing just mad paintings that are very obviously just mad paintings. Yeah, I've seen a lot of 50s future sci-fi. They never actually feel like they're taking place in the future, which I get. I mean, at a certain point, every movie is a product of its present, and that's obviously true, but they... They just have, like, pegboard rooms with yeah. switches and stuff on the walls, and that was their vision of spaceships. Lights. Yeah, so I'm wondering if that's the thing, or if he actually goes a little bit more into... Because he does have the knowledge of what sort of cyberpunky stuff was happening in the, in the 90s and the 80s, if he, if he throws a little bit of that in there, too. I'm gonna guess he goes for the cheap option, Brentley. Probably, yeah. Thus begins a space odyssey as Captain Jackson encounters various strange new life forms as he tries to make his way back to Earth. So, I would like to point out it's called Destination Outer Space. He's trying to leave outer space. Well, his destination was outer space at one point. That's true. He was he was not in outer space, and then he was de- he was destined dest- he was going there. Yeah. But now he's right. he's coming back. He's like, I got there. Now it's destination not outer space. Anywhere but here. (laughs) Alright, next we have Attack of the Moon Zombies from 2011. Favorite title so far. Love it, love it, love it. Pretty fun. Set 20 years after Dr. Edwards encounter with a bat-like creature in the radioactive case system near Phantom Lake, Wisconsin. Now that was in the 50s, right? That's not the weird future-y thing? Uh, I think... We're not getting into modern day. I hope not, anyway. Yeah. Okay. The modern day would be this, like, weird, like, how they would envision 2011 in the 50s. Oh, right, because we're, we're only up to 2011. Okay. Yep. Uh, Dr. Edwards is preparing to start training his successor, Glenn Hayes, at the Jackson Lunar Base in preparation for his retirement in one week. I wonder what's going to happen to him. <laughs> I'm sensing here, I, I can't help but, like, try to unpack what Mr. Mim's process is and sort of how he's making these and I'm, I'm feeling that he put not like a large expense but for a, a, an individual who's just making his own movies a substantial amount of money into building a spaceship and or like moon base type setup that he could shoot in 
and he is right. now that he has it, he's definitely using it in as many movies as he can. It costs money, you gotta use it. Roger Corman mentality. Absolutely. By the way, Roger Corman, I mentioned earlier the sort of people who are making stuff ironically. Roger Corman, not someone making anything ironically. No. Just cranking out copies of whatever was popular for the money. He reused the end of Carnosaur for every one of the movies in that series. <laughs> That's stock footage. That's amazing. Yep. That was a good ending. You paid a lot of money for that dinosaur <laughs> fighting a forklift that was yep. ripped off from aliens. Shoving it down a hole. In the midst of this, he makes a remarkable discovery. A strange plant living inside a cave on the lunar surface, which is the first evidence of alien life. Except for, you know, that one guy that got possessed by alien brains, but that might have been different they times. Just covered up. Obviously. Probably. This guy's not from Wisconsin, he's on the moon. That's fair. Um, There's no Wisconsin's on the moon. There is no Wisconsin's on the moon, or lakes for that matter. <laughs> they, I think that um, the idea of finding a plant that's the first alien, that's kind of a fun, like almost realistic portrayal of <laughs> what you might actually expect to get. It's like, oh yeah, that's some... If if scientists actually found a plant like structure, right? It's not uh not like anything moving around, but it's not just a single cell, I think that would be just like mind blowing. I know that that's not what this movie's going for. It probably still will like move around and control somebody's mind or something. Mind their mind. But uh I, I like what direction here. Unfortunately, the plant spores prove decidedly toxic and the plant kills Glenn Hayes after spraying him with spores. Oh, okay, so we're going for a, like, poisonous thing. I I thought maybe it was going to be, like, full-on Seymour from uh, Little Shop of Horrors. But this is remaining realistic. No, Hayes, is he the guy, I've forgotten the name, from the previous movie? He, no, he's being trained by Jackson. Oh, okay. Um, to be his replacement as scientist of the town, I guess. I don't really know what his job is. Person like who deals with... Uh, global catastrophes. I like the idea of the town scientist. Yeah. It's like everybody, everybody sort of gets their own Neil deGrasse Tyson for their town, who's just like the goodwill ambassador for facts and stuff. <laughs> it's it's a world that literally functions like B movies. So it's like we have to have a scientist in the town because space zombies could happen in a week. Yeah. All right, worse yet, the spores' curious properties animate the bodies of those who are killed by them, causing them to continue spreading the spores as they infect more and more hosts. All right, okay. For some reason, I'd forgotten the amazing title of this at the beginning. I was, I was off in like, well, maybe the plant is animated, but no, of course it kills the people and brings them back to spread the spores around. Are they plant zombies, Brantley? Do you think that they're? I don't know how that would work. And I, um, my imagination tells me that. Or my, my common sense tells me that uh, Mr. Nim probably doesn't have quite enough budget to make up everybody as plant zombies, but I I've mean, seen... The, the fact that this is in black and white actually make that you'd have to have more complicated prosthetics for that. How do you figure? Um, because you can't use color to help sell the thing, so you can't make them just green. Well, yeah, but they could just be I black. I think there's a lot. there's some cheats you can do for black and white, and by this time, I bet he knows some of them. For sure. I have also seen some of the props for some of these movies. Okay. Budget was not great. All right. I, I'm That's envisioning the, 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 the similarly, but maybe not quite as low budget. Z Nation had a plant zombie that was really cool, but it was the one, it was just one. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. if, if you want to have a multiple of zombies, you're probably, uh, probably not going to get that on this level. It will fall to Dr. Edwards and his colleagues to save the world from the so-called moon zombies before they find a way to get to Earth. Uh, why would they find a way to get to Earth? Like, if the moon itself falls, you know, that's bad. I get that, but, um, can the moon zombies fly a rocket? Like, normally on these things, you can understand the... The threat. Right, the thread. It's like, oh, like, there's roads and, you know, things are connected by land and stuff, so obviously the zombies are going to go everywhere. Are these smart zombies? Um, I don't know. Maybe there's, like, an automatic 
ship that goes between Earth and the moon for supplies? Probably that's I true, guess. but I hate that, kind of. <laughs> hey guys, Albert here, interrupting myself to let you guys know that we are actually cutting this episode short so that we can cut it in half. The Mimverse exceeded our expectations as far as how long it was going to take to cover. There is still a whole other 30 minutes of movies to talk about, movie descriptions anyway. Uh, I just want to interject before we finish up. I have, in the intervening time since we recorded this, begun to check out this oeuvre, and it's, it's worth a watch if you are the kind of person who finds yourself interested in these types of movies. I don't want to oversell it, but I will say that it is the kind of movie that is lacking in resources, not lacking in talent and effort. So if you're worried about somebody just kind of slapping something out there, these movies do not seem to be that. I know that this is breaking the rules a little bit because we don't normally talk about the stuff we actually have watched on the show, but uh, it's my show, so I can break whatever rules I want to. Thank you so much for listening. If you're not doing it already, you should subscribe to this, however you get it. And uh, yeah, keep Brentley in your thoughts. He is not deathly sick, not coronavirus as far as we can tell, but his throat's really mangled up. And he talked for an hour about this uh, delightful movie universe uh, made by Mr. Mim. So uh, we wish him a speedy recovery, and we will be back next week with the continuation of the Mimverse. Bye!